This is a first person shooter, obviously, but can you tell me which one it is? And what about this one? This one? Look at how similar all of these games look. Same perspective, same color scheme, same visual language. They follow a pretty rigid formula. Why is that? Why do so many popular video games in the same genre look so similar? Well, it's a genre that makes a lot of money for a lot of really big companies. So from a financial perspective, it makes a lot of sense. A proven success plus less risk equals more money. But then you have rhythm games. And if there was any message modern rhythm games had for people, it would probably be this. Buck realism. Before we get into the video essay, I just wanted to jump in here and remind you to subscribe and like the video for more content like this every single month. It's free and really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. Video games as a concept are pretty weird when you think about it. In an abstracted sense, you're pushing buttons to make pixels light up in a certain order, usually accompanied by a sound effect or two. And over the decades, games have gotten more and more immersive, getting better at tricking us into believing the illusion is reality. But there's one genre that's never really tried to be immersive in the first place. It never even had a fourth wall to break. It's stayed away from trying to be realistic, and I think rhythm games are actually all the better for it. In the age of 4K 60 frames a second gaming, a lot of people have gotten the idea that the closer we get to realism, the better the games are. If a video game lets us see the pores in a character's skin, or get neon sign reflections in puddles, it often gets held up as the new gold standard for video games. And I mean, those puddles are pretty impressive, I'm not gonna lie. The current market values the illusion of realism very highly. We want to be immersed in believable worlds, and forget that we're playing a video game. There's something to be said for the serene calm that can wash over you when you feel at one with a Boeing 737 flying over Berlin. The photorealism of rippling water textures in a river you'll never even see while racing in Forza Motorsport. It's all so... boring. Like, who is asking for this? While visually impressive, does it add much to the gameplay experience? And in five years, will that tactile sense of realism even feel real anymore? It's unlikely, since the goalposts for what looks real are always moving as technology advances. When a title is aiming for realism, it's asking you to willingly forget you're just sitting on a couch looking at your buzzing television, hypnotized. That willing suspension of disbelief, or a moment which constitutes poetic belief. But the balancing act of video game realism relies on so many variables in an equation being just right and not dipping into the uncanny valley. It's the burden of realism. So what happens when games roll along and just hold up a big middle finger to the status quo? When realism was never even in question to begin with? A video game's video game. Games so surreal, they can only be described as fun. The constructions of convention don't really matter anymore when the goal of a game is just pure entertainment value. And that's why I've recently found such a connection to rhythm games. Rhythm games often shrug off expectations of naturalism in favor of the player not suspending their disbelief at all. There are almost always on-screen prompts reminding you that you're holding a controller. And since the very beginning, the genre has stayed in the realm of the abstract. At their core, this genre asks players to rhythmically match button presses to the beat of something happening on screen, 
whether it's music, dancing, whatever this is. But in general, rhythm games keep it simple. And that's what I love about them. In 1987, a lot of gaming tropes were still finding their footing. I mean, this was the year that saving your game's progress on a console game became a thing. So when titles like Dance Aerobics were released this same year, the word rhythm game wouldn't exactly be applicable, but you can definitely see where this game would influence the upcoming wave of music em ups If you look really closely. But if we're talking about all the modern hallmarks of the rhythm game, the very first to pioneer basically all of them all at once was the 1996 masterpiece Parappa the Rapper. Timed button presses to notes flying across the screen? Check. Musical earworms that stick with you for life? Check. And that absolutely batshit visual style? Very check. And the general public agreed. The sales of this game, which was a completely unprecedented risk for Sony at the time, were unbelievable. Once this little, uh, dog won the hearts of players worldwide, developers caught on and got to work. Note flows were refined and judgment lines polished. Dance dances were revolutionized and arcade cabinets sprung up everywhere. Japan exploded with rhythm games that would mesmerize audiences, making rhythm games a fixture of the late 90s and early 2000s. During this boom, you had Activision throw their quasi-punk hat into the ring, following their success with licensing great soundtracks for their Tony Hawk's skateboarding franchise, which had seen better days by this point. With a game like Guitar Hero, Activision's deep pockets were put to great use, capitalizing on a growing interest in music-based games while snagging the rights to some popular tracks that brought in the sales. After a few years of this push into the mainstream, in 2007, Guitar Hero 3 became the first ever video game to hit $1 billion in sales. You would think that meant rhythm games were here to stay, right? Well, with record-breaking sales also come oversaturation and greedy publishers. Again, this is Activision. Activision pushed out more and more spin-offs until the general public had had enough. There's only so long you can milk an IP before the proverbial teat dries up. It seemed that games relying on scrolling notes and licensed music had flown too close to the sun. Even so, AAA developers were looking to recreate the DDR craze solely to sell wacky new peripherals, with diminished returns. The boom is still going strong in Japanese arcades, where you can find the neon pulses and thumping bass of thousands upon thousands of cabinets. But outside of those arcade towers, rhythm games aren't as common as they once were, unless you know where to look. Indie creators are carving out their own path and finding ways to innovate the genre's hallmarks to take some bold risks that big video game would never. Of course you have your Friday Night Funkin' and the like, which are great, but it seems like indie rhythm games are a no man's land of creativity, where almost no idea is too wacky or too weird. And it's a fucking joy. That's the unique thing about the rhythm game genre. It takes advantage of the abstract nature of the video game medium, whereas so many other pockets of the gaming space are pushing for realism. Rhythm games are happily marching to the beat of their own drum. Immersion be damned. From the very start, rhythm games never kept up any pretense about what was going on. You, the player, are holding a controller and pressing buttons to the beat of what's being shown on screen. Button prompts always remained firmly in view while you played. So was realism ever even an option? Because the fourth wall was never even there to begin with, many fun concepts get to be utilized since there's no need to shoehorn in an explanation for a fun mechanic. So where a game like Hades needs to justify why we can die and resurrect and try again, with a narrative plot device to back it up, Everhood doesn't need to explain why we're using the backdrop of a rhythm game as a fighting arena. We just are. 
and it's fun, and that's all we need to know. That symbolic conceptualism can just be taken at face value. Rhythm games can really lean into a great hook or gimmick without rationalizing what we're doing because we're playing a video game. And with that abstraction of the video game format also comes flexibility. First person shooters can usually only really be one thing. Usually. Same goes for most other genres too. But a rhythm game with a flexible hook can be a million different things. A million different realities and bite-sized ideas that start and finish just in time to not overstay their welcome. These creative gems use the rhythm game as a backdrop for experimentation and breaking new ground. Whereas most gaming genres have their established tropes in place, with experimentation and subversion being rare treats. I would say rhythm games, especially indie ones, are all about subversion. The experimentation is the trope. That and the incredible soundtracks, of course. The note flow that was a hallmark of the genre originally isn't even a guarantee anymore. Sometimes there's not even really a melody. That sense of adventure is one of the main reasons that rhythm games are still so loved today, years after the era of their mainstream success. But that isn't to say the boom of rhythm games hasn't left its mark elsewhere in the gaming space. Even though the plastic peripherals and dance pads of the early 2000s might be a thing of the past and stuffing landfills to this day, the rhythm game footprint can be seen virtually everywhere in modern gaming. I mean, QTEs? Predetermined button inputs where your success is based on timing? Yes, I am telling you Asura's Wrath is just one big macho rhythm game. And you can't tell me otherwise. Even though I used first-person shooters as the antithesis of rhythm games in this video's intro, Metal Hellsinger and BPM Bullets Per Minute found ways to incorporate rhythm game elements into the first-person shooter genre. In fact, at this point, just about every genre you can think of has had some tempo-based crossover with rhythm games. Roguelike dungeon crawlers, horror, it's everywhere. And if you look under the hood of a lot of action games, you'll see some rhythm game design concepts there as well. An enemy attack that's telegraphed well in advance that, with precision timing, you can block, if not outright parry? That's just your average note flow and judgment line, disguised as a skeleton or whatever this guy is. Games rewarding a player's timing is also something that would feel right at home to a rhythm game expert. You can absolutely button mash your way through Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, for example. You might even win a few matches of Street Fighter. But to get that elusive S rank, for example, you'll have to use your rhythm game reflexes to show those demons who's boss. And explicitly rhythm game themed sections have found their way into some unexpected places too. After a particularly tough fight against the Hell House in Final Fantasy VII's remake, the Honey Bee Inn rewards players with some of the most camp silliness in recent memory. And you guessed it, it's a rhythm game section. The built-in camp factor of a rhythm game section has the same energy as a TV show giving us an out-of-nowhere musical episode. At first, you might ask yourself, hey, why is this here? I didn't sign up for this. Until you realize, Oh right, I'm just here to have fun, and this is fun, and that's okay. I'll happily accept some silly colorful fun to break up some frustrating boss fights. Hell yeah. The best video games I've ever played aren't the ones that are gruelingly difficult or visually spectacular. While those things are definitely nice, what I value most in a game, or really any piece of media, is expressiveness. That ability to communicate something to me on an intangible human level. I don't need a game to have an earth-shattering twist at the end. If I'm playing a game and it's emotionally resonant, then that's a 10 out of 10 for me. Which is why some of the most resonant storytelling I've seen in recent years is in rhythm games. Not necessarily within the classic note flows of something like Friday Night Funkin', but in the hazy currents of something like Sayonara Wild Hearts or Rhythm Doctor. Music is a universal language and one of the most powerful expressions of the human soul. It's why this 
will immediately transport you if you recognize those notes. It's even been hypothesized that the hippocampus, the brain's memory generator, is the area most affected through music listening. So many of our most cherished memories involving some kind of musical ties isn't really a surprise. When games attach a heartfelt story to the interactivity of music-based gameplay, our brain naturally connects to those emotions a lot more strongly. If the story of self-acceptance in Sayonara Wild Hearts were presented in any other genre than a rhythm game, it wouldn't have felt as personal or as expressive. Not being bound to the traditional conventions of video game storytelling was very much to Samogo's advantage. The same could be said for any number of inventive rhythm games. Would visualizing anxiety, arrhythmia, and heartbreak work as well if Rhythm Doctor was a platformer, for example? Most of the time, games have their soundtracks added on after the gameplay, story, and visuals are all finished. Rhythm games have the unique advantage of being built around the music, and that's what sets them apart from a storytelling perspective. It seems like pure and unfiltered rhythm games are going to stay on the indie market for the time being. Although the genre has been a huge influence on modern game design, I think the wacky and weird titles that we love coming out of the rhythm game genre just aren't going to hit the mainstream again anytime soon. But honestly, that might be for the best. The emotional and experimental indie output we're getting from rhythm games right now is best kept away from the meddling hands of AAA publishers. If we look at the highest selling games of the past few years, the vast majority of video game consumers are looking for something gritty and realistic. But like, fuck realism, man. The real world over the past couple of years has proven to be a real dumpster fire. Let me escape realism for one second. I just want to have fun and wacky adventures with a banger soundtrack sometimes. Also, are mainstream AAA shooters gonna give you glorious memes like this? I don't think so. Hey there! Thank you so much for watching the video essay, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to click the like button down below and subscribe to the channel. I put over 40 plus hours into these video essays to get them out to you on the first Saturday of every single month, so I would really appreciate it. Doing that also helps the video get seen by more people and helps this channel grow. Speaking of helping out, these videos aren't cheap to make, to be honest. So if you believe in the content and want to help me do this full time, you can always support with donations on Ko-fi. It's kind of like Patreon, but a little bit better. You can also become a monthly member over there for as little as $4 a month, like these wonderful people did. A huge, huge, huge thank you to Robertson, Oyster Milk, Cap Danvers, Actual Folk Boy, Puzzled Monkey Tree, Velt Walker, Mumpow, Foxamandius, Undies Marita, Nightmare God, Bean Fiello, Dear Papaya, A Werewolf, and Jar Draws Pixels. Thank y'all so much, it means the world. For as little as $4 a month, you can help support the content and get shoutouts at the end of the video here, see extra content, and get sneak peeks at future video essays. Also, if you do want to check out any of the games that I mention in any of my video essays, there's always affiliate links for you to check out in my descriptions. They help both the channel and support trans charities at no extra cost to you. And often they have sales that Steam doesn't even have, so it's worth looking. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. It means a lot. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one, okay? Oh yeah, go share the video. Thank you.